Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We ask, Lord, that it would penetrate our hearts. That, Lord, we would be so desirous to know you more fully because your word is, has done something within us this morning. We want to encounter you through your word and spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. As many of you know, our son Ben and his family live in Colorado Springs. And one of the places that visitors often want to go to when they're there is Pikes Peak. On our first trip to visit Ben, we, he drove us up there. And it's important to remember that in, in Colorado Springs, you're still at about 6,000 feet above sea level. And I noticed that as I carried luggage upstairs, I was winded. I wasn't acclimated to it yet. However, when you get to Pikes Peak, the elevation is 14,115 feet above sea level. And there's a visitor center at the top that you go into, and for only $5, they'll give you a hit of oxygen. <laughs> Somebody was an entrepreneur. It's a good idea also to bring a coat because the difference in temperature is very extreme. It was in the 70s in Colorado Springs, but it was 27 on top of Pikes Peak, and it was windy. And every year there's a, there's a Pikes Peak marathon. And there aren't many marathons like it. It's, it's a 7,800-foot vertical climb. And the course takes, run takes runners from Manitou Springs, which is approximately 6,900 feet, and go along what's called Bar Trail, which is a very narrow, very rocky, very treacherous trail, and it ends at the summit at Pikes Peak, and then you turn around and you go right back. It's extreme. This is that what it says in the online brochure for the event. The course for the marathon is unique and very physically demanding when compared to other marathons. Beginning in downtown Manitou Springs, the course proceeds along approximately 1.5 miles of road before joining into Pikes Peak Bar Trail. This is where the real adventure begins with an average grade of 11%. The trail is often narrow and winding, steep, and maybe gravel, rock, or dirt with sharp turns and abrupt changes in elevation or direction. However, there are no exposed ledges, so there's little danger of falling off the trail. Keep in mind, there's no vehicle access to most of our trails. So to ensure the safety of our runners and volunteers, all participants are required to compete a qualifying event before they can register. It's recommended that you arrive one to two weeks before the marathon so that you can be acclimated. That kind of depends on where you're coming from, but so you can be acclimated to the difference in the altitude. On one of our, our trips out to Colorado, I, I sat next to a fellow from Arkansas who was going to Colorado Springs to land there and then to run the marathon in two days. He told me he was going to compete, and, and I asked him why he chose to come so late, because it's, I mean, two days is not enough. He says, yeah, I know, I, I know, but I mean, I, I just didn't have much time. And you have to understand that most of Arkansas is about 500 feet above sea level, and even the very peak of the state is in, it's called Mount Magazine at 2,753 feet. Isn't it amazing what I know? It's a, <laughs> But he told me, yes, he knew that he was cutting it short, but he felt he'd be all right. I, I wished him well, but I, I thought to myself that he likely wouldn't even qualify, much less complete the course. I thought about that fellow this week as I cons considered at this morning's passages. The treacherous course that he was planning to run was not going to show him any personal favoritism because he did not have time to prepare. It was the responsibility of those who run the race to respect the course and to be ready to make the run. There would be one winner in the race, and that person who won, he did so because he had prepared and did what was expected to run a race like that. And this morning, I want to compare the message that God through, spoke through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and our gospel reading from John 14, verses 15 to 21. And our goal this morning is to be reminded that we are indeed running a race. 
and the prize is eternal life in the presence of the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth. And it comes with instructions concerning what it means to run the race and receive the prize. And to ignore it is to forfeit the prize, which has dire consequences. So let's begin by considering Deuteronomy. This is the last book in the section called the Pentateuch, which are the five, uh, first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And during the wilderness wanderings of Israel, Moses wrote down the words given to him by God so that his chosen nation, Israel, would know him. And as they went with him, they would know who it was they were following. Who it was that was showing them miraculous signs and wonders? And who was providing for them in amazing ways? And, and went before them even to defeat those who were trying to, to destroy them. Other nations who come against them. God went before them and defeated their enemies. This was the God they were following, and they needed to know that. They needed to know who he was and how unusual it would be for a God like that to do what he did for them. And they needed to believe that where he was leading them was much greater, much greater blessing than anything they had before or could conceive of. Deuteronomy was written as the children of Israel were preparing to enter the promised land. Moses was writing to the second generation of the Exodus. I mean, their, their faithless parents had died in the wilderness because they would not be obedient to God. They challenged him at every corner, and God finally said, you're not going to go into the promised land. Your, your children will, but you won't. And so they spent 40 years traveling across the desert until all of the parents had passed away. But he spared the children in order to preserve a holy people and to maintain the promises he had made to the forefathers, beginning with Abraham. And even Moses was not going to be allowed to enter the promised land. So before he died, he restated God's law to them in order that it would guide them into covenant commitment and covenant renewal under Joshua. He wanted to exhort this new generation to avoid, avoid the sins of their parents and to commit to the law of God so that they could experience the blessings instead of his judgment. What God was offering was his love and his favor, but it would require that they keep his commandments, that they were made faithful to him as their God, as their king. Israel was to remember who God was and their experiences under the leadership of Moses. And this morning, this passage, he reminds Israel of all that God had done in their midst. Moses was inviting Israel to think back to all they had heard about God since they had, he had created man upon the earth and to remember all that God had done in their presence, all the things they had heard him say to Moses. Had they ever heard of any God who would do such a thing? Had they ever heard of any God who acted toward his people in such a profound way? and who rescued them from other nations like their God had. And Moses encouraged them to remember the experience of hearing God thundering from Mount Sinai and speaking to them out of the fire and the smoke. Did any other nations experience their gods doing such a thing for them? Had they ever heard of any god choosing a nation for special favor or to defend them from other nations? From the very, very beginning of time, they had never heard of such a thing. But through Yahweh, he was prepared to build that kind of relationship in their lives. From the very beginning, he had revealed himself to them in so many ways that showed the mercy and the power and the glory of God. He had struck terror into their hearts of their enemies. And they had seen his mighty hand and his outstretched arm as he performed miracle after miracle, as he fed them by manna falling on the ground and water coming out of a rock. And in 30, verses 36 and 38, Moses reminds them that God had demonstrated this power and glory through his mighty presence and had, had driven out from before them nations who were greater and mightier than they were. 
so that they could take possession of all that God had promised to their forefathers, beginning with Abraham. And their response to all that God had done, it should come from what they knew about him and what he had commanded them to do. There should be no hesitation on their part to follow a God like that if they would only consider what he had already done on their behalf. And so Moses sums it all up in Deuteronomy 4, 39 to 40. Know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven and above and on the earth beneath, and there is no other. Therefore you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you for all time. I want to share with you a quote from, from John Piper in his book, Desiring God. He says, if you don't see the greatness of God, then all the things that money can buy become very exciting. If you can't see the sun, then you'll be impressed with a street light. If you've never felt thunder and lightning, you'll be impressed with fireworks. And if you turn your back on the greatness and majesty of God, you'll fall in love with a world of shadows and short-lived pleasures. I think this is exactly what Moses is reminding Israel to remember as they enter into the land of promise. Remember what you have seen of God. Remember what you have heard from God. Remember how you have experienced him and remain faithful to him. Be in awe and wonder of a God like that. A God of glory, a God of majesty, a God of power and strength. A God who was majestic, who, who reached out to you in love to establish a relationship with you as a nation. Who have ever heard of such a thing? And Moses, who had dwelt in the presence of the Lord on top of Mount Sinai for weeks at a time, who had beheld God in his glory and lived... He now stood before the children of Israel, the second generation, as they prepare to go into the promised land. And he wants to persuade them of the love of God, of the power, the mercy, and the character of God that he knew so well. He's going to restate to them all that God has said so that they can remember the God who met him on the mountain. And they were to let it be written on their hearts, and they should teach their children and to their children's children to every generation so they would never forget their God and all that he had done for them. And now, as you, as you know, as long as Israel remembered these things, they prospered as a people. But when they forgot, it only took one generation for them to begin the decline and eventually become just like the pagan nations all around them. Their gods seemed to be even, not even a memory to most. They forgot, but God did not. Because God remembered, we're in a season of Eastertide, and we're heading towards Pentecost because God remembered his covenant. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ and remembering that all he taught about the resurrection and the promised kingdom to come. And it would not come until he passed. He did the one thing that should amaze us. He not only came on our behalf, but now he's going to send us the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost to equip us like no one had ever been equipped before. There are striking similarities to the words of Jesus in John 14, 15 to 21 and the exhortation of Moses in Deuteronomy 4, 32 to 40. So let's read again John 14, 15 to 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Just like Moses, Jesus is equating love to obedience to the commands of God. In verse 12 of John 14, Jesus has promised, Truly, truly, I say to you, anyone who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. 
So when Jesus makes the statement, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, it's not so, so much a promise as to the definition of what love looks like. It's not really referring to the ethical standards that Jesus had laid out in places like Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. John, John doesn't do too much of that. It's to be the response of the whole of Jesus' teaching, and more importantly, how he lived. That was the model we were to have. As the Apostle John would write, would write later on in 1 John 2, 6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And the model that Jesus had given them, his disciples, was that he was completely dependent on and obedient to the Father. He told them that he only did what he heard the Father say. He only did what he saw the Father doing. And doing this, he's modeling a life of loving obedience to the will of the Father. His faith and love unite themselves to God and make it possible for them to do greater things. Greater things that Jesus, that Jesus did because they'll have access to all the resources of the kingdom of God. Everything is there at their disposal if they will only faithfully follow this God. And the promise then is that if they will pursue the obedient love, he said, I'll, I'll ask the Father and he will send you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Jesus was the divine presence upon earth, and he's going to go back to the Father and be the human presence in heaven on our behalf. And the Spirit was to be the helper as opposed to the enemy who is the accuser of the brethren. You can always tell the difference of what's speaking to you by whether you feel accused or whether you feel encouraged. The Holy Spirit would come and take the place of Christ with the apostles to lead God's people into a deeper understanding and to a deeper knowledge of the gospel truth. This would give them the ability and the strength to be the presence of Jesus to all those around him. And so it would be if Jesus himself was still present in the community. Jesus is coming to earth, in his coming to earth, ushered in the kingdom presence. And through the Holy Spirit, the disciples were to continue the mission that he had begun. The Spirit would give them the power to overcome and to undergo trials and temptation and persecution that would come, promised to come because of the opposition to the divine kingdom coming to earth. And Jesus tells them they're going to struggle. And it will happen because the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you, will be in you forever. Again, we see a similarity between Jesus' words in John 14 and the exhortation of Moses in Deuteronomy 4. Jesus was announcing that the divine presence would inhabit, would live within those who chose faithful obedience to the commandments of God. They would not be dwelling, merely dwelling in the presence of God, but God dwelling within them, a very different thing. So this power, his power and his glory could be made manifest through his people if they chose obedience. God's holy presence would allow his people to know him in a way they had never known him before or conceived or imagined that they ever could. The next statement firms up the relationship with the Father that Jesus was securing for them. Let's read John 14, 18 to 20. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you'll see me. Because I live, you also will live. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now some have suggested that Jesus was assuring them that he was not abandoning them as orphans, but he would come back to receive them. I think much more is involved here. Jesus is the only way to the Father, and without him, they would, they would be orphaned. They would have no hope. However, he is promising that he will come back, not signifying the second coming, but after the resurrection. 
It was then that he would impart the Holy Spirit to them in power in a way they had never known God before. He would ask the Father to send the Spirit in the same power that brought about the resurrection. And when that happened, they would be united to him by the Spirit and come to share in him who is the resurrection and the life. This indwelling would enable them to do the greater things spoken of in verse 12. What had been true of Jesus would now be true of them. Not that they would be the unique Son of God, but they would continue as those who were created, who now sharing in divine life. Jesus, the Son of God, condescended to come down to us as a human being so that those who were created would become one with a divine presence indwelling them. Do you see what he's done? He's come, we talk about it usually, and we receive his righteousness and he takes our sin, and that's true. But in this case, we're receiving divine life with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and he takes on our humanity. Who got the better deal here? Again, this should cause us to declare with joy and amazement. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who could have imagined that God would offer to those whom he had created a relationship with him that is so complete and lacking nothing? The Apostle John affirms this promise 55 to 65 years later, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, after Jesus had spoke these words. He had lived in that joy of the relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it had been the source of his strength and his power as an apostle. He had been used of God to grow the early church and, and to declare in the latter days of his life. Let's look at 1 John 3, 22 to 24. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandment and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit to whom he has given us. The apostle had lived out that promise, the promise of Jesus, and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit for many years. It caused him to be an effective witness to the saving power of Jesus Christ and to the spirit of truth that indwelled him as an obedient servant, a follower of Jesus and his commandments. He had given his life to the proclamation of this gospel message, and I can only imagine that he felt the same way as Moses when he declared to the children of Israel the necessity of obedience to the commands of God as he saw them walking away, as he saw them not obeying the command of God. There had to be that sense of a, of a father mourning for the children. Please come back. You don't seem to understand. What John and Moses understood, they knew deeply. And they were hopeful that the readers of their writings and the listeners would see the awe and the wonder of their message. The news of God's love and desire for a relationship with his creation was so profound and yet so life-giving that rightly understood would cause men and women to cry out, why would he do that? Who ever thought God would do something like that? The news of God's love and their desire for a relationship with his creation should be enough for them to follow him in all things. And the reason for the believer to be obedient to God's commands is not a prerequisite for salvation, but the response and the definition of love itself. When we come to a saving knowledge of Christ, we may come out of fear because we don't want to go to hell. But after you know him, after you see his commands, after you have experienced the Spirit's presence in your life, you want to follow because you love him. And you can't imagine why he would ever come to you, why he would offer this to you. 
This is the, the response that Jesus is speaking of. And he wasn't referring to his teachings on, on ethics. Again, John doesn't record many of those things in his gospel, but to the whole of his teaching, especially seen through how he lived his life and who he lived his life for. Does this description with Jesus of Jesus describe your life or our life? That's really the question before us this morning, isn't it? For whom and for what do we live our lives? Are we living before God as an expression of our love for him? Is he the primary focus of our thinking? Or do we seek to bring glory and honor to God through our decisions and our actions? Fortunately, these questions are rhetorical. I'm not asking you to give me an answer. I'm asking you to ask the Lord that, to show your heart to you. I'm asking God to show us this week that we might remember all that he has done and marvel at that and be saying, who ever heard of such a thing? Do you really want to see revival? I know a lot of people, we're praying for revival. We're praying for a great awakening happening in our land. Is it magic? Are there special words we got to know so we can say it and it happens? This is not a Harry Potter book. This is God's people becoming obedient to the word of God and loving him and following his commandments. If you want to see revival, that's the beginning of a revival. And I'm here to tell you, it almost always starts in the heart of God's people. We must begin by asking God to speak to our hearts, to change us, whatever it costs. And to raise us up for his glory is our highest desire. Let's pray. Lord God, this morning we come before you. And we have to rightly say, Lord, who ever heard of such a thing? Lord, the more we walk with you, the more amazing you are, the more amazing we, we see you. And Lord, as we've been studying in this Behold Your God series, Lord, it's like we get a bigger view of who you are, which makes us have a lesser view of who we are. And Lord, we see the, the depth of your love and your mercy, and it changes us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to move in us as people and as a church, that our greatest desire is to reveal the love of Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel message. And it's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.